here at Paramount was that you were supposed to do Beverly Hills Cop right. 1. Right. What happened? All right. I knew that all the baggage I bring with me as a character and the roles I played, people wouldn't buy me being that naive. Mm -hmm. Coming into Beverly Hills, being thrown through windows, going, wow, wide-eyed in Babylon. Yeah. I said it would have to be a little bit different, a little harder edge. Mm -hmm. uh, a fellow who's coming here on, on, on a duty and everything else, but with a little less comedy because he's, he's just not that intrigued by it. I just don't think people would buy me as, as going, God, look at all this. It's just too much. So we had changed it, and it was a very, very good script. And then at the last second, they said, no, we want the comedy back. And I said, well, I can't do it. I really can't. Right. I think, you know, Eddie, yeah. would, you, know, you need a comedian. I can't pull it off. And the rest is history. And I went on to do something really stupid after that and whatever it was. What did you do right after that? Well, I was supposed to. Someone sent me a script called Romance in the Stone. And then they sent me a script called Rhinestone. And I guess I had one oh. beer too many and I took the wrong one. <laughs> I kind of felt that uh, Marion Cobretti, yes, Marion Cobretti, in a sense, was what you wanted to do with Cop One. Yes, closer to it, right? In, in Cobra, we were uh, trying to move towards that kind of Hollywood cop. It was like Bruce Springsteen with a badge, you know, mm -hmm. it was that kind of a thing. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and we, I kind of accomplished it. I took a lot of flack in Cobra because what's happening in America, and predominantly in California, you're breeding a new kind of criminal, a criminal that kills for the mere gratification of killing. Mm -hmm. It isn't as though it has to be motivated. You can be standing on the street corner, you can be minding your own business. It's just a bloodlust. It's a thrill. Yeah. And we're giving rise to that, and especially in California. This seems to be the mecca for serial killers. So I said, you know, how is this ever going to uh, be alleviated? You cannot, with law enforcement, deal with that kind of mentality in a sober, ethical, normal procedure. You're dealing with a madman, and you're going... In other words, he has no rules, mm -hmm. no rules, and you're playing with rules. Mm -hmm. He's going to beat you every time. Right. All right? He can go out of bounds whenever he wants. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, I'm going to develop a cop who deals with them on their own terms. Right. And I got the idea. In Belgium, there's a group called the Zombie Squad, and these cops go out at night and basically take care of these kind of things on their own. Mm -hmm. And so I tried to move it into... To, a feature, and I took a lot of flack. I said, well, do you agree with vigilantism? I said, no, 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 it's not vigilantism, but it's a much harder kind of policeman dealing with a much kind of harder, uh, hard criminal. Right. You know? uh, in, in Lockup, there's a real sensitive side to the character that you play. Um, if you notice what you did for your woman in that, right. you kind of see a different side of Stallone's characters. Are you anything like that? Do you ever cry? <laughs> oh. I'm glad you asked. <laughs> I mean, when is the last Every... time you ever cried? <clears throat> when I looked at my bank statements after my last marriage. I, you know... <laughs> it's a man's world. Yeah. <laughs> Not just joking. No, no, no. I think, I think that crying, I mean, it, it comes on when you least expect it. it, it it's a, it isn't as though a certain event. I think we have a great deal of tolerance. It's it just, all of a sudden you'll be driving down the freeway and you, you get this overwhelming sense of gloom or pent up frustration and it starts to, you know, burst forth. Yeah. It isn't as though one single event. Uh, I felt when my child, last time I could really truthfully remember breaking down was when my last when when my second child was diagnosed autistic mm -hmm. that was bad that was that was a real bad situation and i can't recall after that uh, really ever having that kind of um, pain yeah well you you referred to the marriage a couple times um now i'm doing it facetiously you know yeah. i but, but i i think that if i were to keep it pent up Mm -hmm. That's oh, when yeah. you begin to eat away at yourself. So I just lay it out. But what surprises me is I know a lot of men, after a situation like that, the could seriously become bitter, bitter and close stuff off. Most and, do. And I saw you wink to somebody in, over there. Uh, 
So you obviously... You mean the girl with the pantyhose in her head. <laughs> I, I couldn't help it. Yeah, okay. But, uh, no, obviously, you've gotten your, yourself together. And, uh, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah. You've gotten yourself together, and, yeah, and you're guess. surging forth. Yes, I think so. I think that at this point, I really feel the clock is running. And you can't just put an anchor around your life and drag it. So, yeah, you made a mistake, and they always use this adage, well, you're wiser for it. Well, I could have, I would have liked to have missed that day in school. I didn't want to be wiser for it, but you made the mistake. You were naive in life. Now, forget about it, because you really only have a few hours on Earth. I mean, I, I broke this down one day. This is how mental I can become. Mm -hmm. If you live to be about 72, 73 years old, it's about 750,000 hours. You figure you sleep away a third of it. Uh, your first 10 years on Earth, you're really not accomplishing much. Mm -hmm. And then when you get older, you're really not accomplished that much. So you have a prime in there of about 200,000 hours. That's it. That is it. So, yeah. <laughs> what are we doing here? Yeah. <laughs> Let's go to your house. <laughs> We'll take a commercial and we'll talk about that. <laughs> I like to win. We should do that script that I wasn't going to do with Eddie. Mm -hmm. Do with you. Oh, the 50-50? Yeah. Back. Big on the world. That's a, that's a good script. Yeah, okay. It was one of those things that, you know, um, it just didn't work out. It was about the time of Beverly Hills Cop. And it's, it's incredible how many deals fall through. And then another guy picks it up and it becomes a hit, whatever. It's amazing mm -hmm. that, that you even find a hit nowadays. It's so, yeah. it's so hard. But you should do a lot of movies. You're great. Thanks, man. Thank you. Um, speaking of good scripts, your mother always had faith in you as a writer. Yes. What did she see in you that made her know? You know, that's very strange because I, I was writing poetry. Uh, I was... You know, I was faint of heart, and I was, and I would, I would constantly spend many, many hours alone, and I would, I would chronicle it and, and mm -hmm. keep diaries. And I guess I had a, a way with trying to um, put my imaginations, my fantasies on, on paper. But I don't know how she knew. I really don't. Unless she was going through my drawers. Yeah. Which is possible. Because she said in many interviews she always knew. Tell me about the first time you ever made love. <laughs> <laughs> I've thought, heard this story before, but I won't name it. No, again. you're not. <laughs> yes, I, still, I, I still have a gear shift indentation in my ribs. I, <laughs> no, I can't. I, yes, actually, can. it's, it's, which one was it? The one in the car. Oh, that one. Oh, please. Are you crazy? It was one of those. It I, had an unhappy ending. Damn right it did. It had a terrible one. <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> there was no heat in the car, you know. It was one of those nights where you think you're going to come out like Valentino and you leave like... Like Oscar Bonavita. Like, yeah, 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 Oscar. <laughs> you remember yeah. Oscar. I know, yes, I sure do. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a very good... You know, you, you, when you're very young, the anticipation is, is, is overwhelming. You're sitting there like Mount Vesuvius. You know, you're just ready to <laughs> blow your stack, you know. Guys are terrible. You know, young men are very, very different. They, they, they walk around at the house. You gotta cover all the keyholes. You gotta, like, you know, knot holes. You gotta, the crack of dawn makes you horny. You know, you have to, they, you're terrible. You're terrible. So... I'll leave it at that, but it, I, it, I did get a rematch. I did get a rematch. Well, you gotta explain to them what that means, though. It just, it just wasn't good. It wasn't... It wasn't... It didn't come off the way I thought it was going to come off. Literally and figuratively and everything else. You know, it's tough to make love in a Fiat 600. You know. <laughs> and and wasn't, wasn't there a third party who entered into the scene? Oh, God. Arsenio. I, no, it's not what you all think. It's not what you all think. I, I, I refuse to go to Okay, this. we won't talk about that. Moving right along. <laughs> What's next? Yeah, I remember that day. Our first love. <laughs> oh. I say, I was eight and he was seven. Yeah, I was first. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't a fall into something, you know? I'm no, not going to do it. It wasn't like that. It was... You Why know. don't you tell it? Because I can't. I'm embarrassed. <laughs> I swear. You know, I always feel that God will punish you if you kiss and tell. One day, all of a sudden, you can look down and it's gone. <laughs> I 
I swear, I, I have this fear that I said, you can't kiss and tell because you're karma. You know what I say? Everything comes around, everything will come around and fall down. I'm, I'm just... Okay, I'm saying, I won't let you out of this yeah, one. Thank God. Sylvester Stallone. Lock up. <laughs>